stripper at a men's conference? In front of that was a man who ripped his shirt off like a woman does in front of a pole at a strip club. And what transpired after? The people are literally screaming. I talked to Mark for a half hour. He's out of line. I'm sorry, like, this bothers me. The pastor invited him to speak at his church, and he had a message for the church, a good message, a darn good message. And then he calls him off the stage, doesn't allow him to get the message. Okay, so this is literally the story that everyone is talking about this week, Don. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it, it, it won't go in. It just don't fit in there. That's one way to say it. This, this is the story that literally everyone was talking about this week, and I couldn't go very far into my YouTube feed without seeing something about it. But before we do that, I want to take one minute to tell you that Gospel Ministries exists to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. So make sure you smash those share, like, and subscribe buttons, and go to PastorAJ.com where you can formally partner with this ministry. Subscribe to my weekly email newsletter, get my new book, End Times Mission, a great introduction to biblical eschatology. Now let's dive in. All right, Don. So again, I just felt like this was a crazy story this week. I think when we see something like this, we need to figure out what in the heck is going on. A lot of times there is more to the story than we realize, but that obviously doesn't mean that it isn't something that should be talked about. Basically, what we saw here was an act at a men's conference, a very large men's conference out west. And at this conference, you had a formerly male stripper doing an act, and it was just an act of strength, a show of strength, where he was climbing up a pole with his hands. But definitely strange for a men's conference. And then a pastor, the keynote speaker of the conference, his, his name is Pastor Mark Driscoll, he gets up and he rebukes this display as satanic, demonic, and basically he gets kicked off the stage. So, so this is kind of what transpired. I'm going to, you're hearing about this for the first time. Tell me, yeah. tell me what some of your thoughts are. I, I can't believe it. Like I said, it just don't fit in my brain. I, I don't, I just don't understand why you would think you would do that. Yeah. It, it is a very, very strange situation. Here's a great intro from Ruslan on what exactly transpired. A Christian men's conference allowed a horrifying and cringe performance that led to this celebrity pastor calling them out at the conference. Now, this is one of the most interesting things I have seen happen at the same conference. And there's multiple important characters in this conversation that we're going to have to go over. And a twist that no one is talking about or saw coming. So make sure you watch till the end of this video for all the details. Now, the pastor that did the call out is no other than Pastor Mark Driscoll. No stranger to controversy. He's gone viral multiple times for having W take after W take in the last several months, even garnering the attention of Ben Shapiro reacting to one of his videos. Young men are over mothered under father. All the fathers said, amen. When the boy is little, does he need his mother? Yes. So mother's in the first position, father's in the second position. When the boy gets older, needs his father. Controversial more than his mother. Absolutely true. By the way, that doesn't kick in at like 20. That kicks in for, for little boys at like five. But his appearance as a guest keynote speaker at James Rivers Men's Conference did not go as expected. So there's a good snapshot, a good lead into the situation. You can see that there's multiple layers to this, but here's video. Are you ready for this, Don? I guess. <laughs> of what actually transpired at this men's conference over the weekend. We're going to talk about how to be an Elijah. And how to deal with they have a Jezebel. But let me do this. I've been up since one o'clock in the morning. The reason I'm hoarse is I have been praying for you and my heart is very burdened for you. Okay, so you can see basically what happens here is the day before this at the conference, because it was a two-day conference, 
you had the male stripper act. And then the next day you have the keynote speaker, Mark Driscoll, come up. He says that he's been, he couldn't sleep all night. He is, you know, had to, had this strong feeling that he needed to speak to this. And that's when this transpires here. And I want to be very careful with this. And it's not what I want to say. The Jezebel spirit opened our event. This is a rebuke and a correction of no one. This is an observation. Before the word of God was open, on it was a pole, an ashram. The same thing that's used in a strip club for women who have the Jezebel spirit to seduce men. In front of that was a man who ripped his shirt off like a woman does in front of a pole at a strip club. I mean, it, it is interesting that, you know, he's making these connections here and he's saying this. Th this is a huge men's conference, Don. Like if you, if you see pictures of the audience here, it's, it's like it's a packed arena. And uh, they, they, they've they done spectacular over the top things at this this you know, this men's event where they have like, they had a tank, I guess, last year come in and oh, wow. roll over these cars, all these like, you know, supposedly manly things. But it is kind of funny that you've got a man coming in at a men's conference and ripping his shirt off, a former stripper. Supposedly this guy's a Christian now, <laughs> the stripper. Okay. But he... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he pulls his shirt off at a men's conference. I mean, it just seems a little misplaced. Is that all he took off? So what you'll see next is he, now he, he's in the middle of his presentation here, but he doesn't get much much farther because the pastor comes up and rebukes him and calls him off. And then ascended. See, our God is not arrogant. He doesn't ascend. Our God is humble. He descended. And then he swallowed a sword and Jesus cried, okay, Pastor John, I'll receive that. You can actually hear him yelling from the crowd, Mark, this isn't right, you know, yelling at him from the crowd. And that was when Pastor Mark said, you know, OK, I'll receive that and step down from the platform. Now, keep in mind, he was hired to come in and, and basically give like the big speech at the end of this conference to these men. This and guy was took his shirt off. No, 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 the pastor. So so the pastor comes up and he says this, and then he gets rebuked, he gets called off stage, and it turns into to, to kind of a, it turns into a big deal. I mean, like I said, everyone, it's an, it's an understatement to say everyone's been talking about this. But then take a look at what happened in the moments that followed this after he came back down off the stage. The people are literally screaming, booing. They're, they're screaming and yelling at him for, for calling Pastor Mark off of the stage. Mark wanted to say that, you should have said it to me first. Matthew 18, if your brother offends you, go to him privately. I talked to Mark for a half hour. There was not one word of that. He's out of line. Okay, so you can see what was taking place here. And this, okay, so I think you can get a good picture for the scene that was taking place here and what was going on. You can see the anger, the outrage at the people. I, I mean, many of whom I, I would imagine felt the same way that Mark Driscoll did about this particular presentation. You know, was it an actual strip tease? No, the guy took his shirt off, but it just seems like it was re a really strange place for a man to come take his shirt off. You can see from previous footage of this particular men's conference, the different outlandish things they did. You know, some of which are cool. I'm not saying from a church perspective, like we've never done anything, you know, wild and crazy to try to try to reach yeah. people. But at the very least, the idea of having a formerly male stripper with a pole tear his shirt off. I don't know why he didn't wear an undershirt. I, I mean, just a, a regular <laughs> shirt underneath there. He didn't need to take his shirt off at all. No, I mean, I mean, at the very least, it, the, the images that it conjures up, especially knowing this guy, right now a Christian with a stripper past. And, and apparently he did go and he didn't just strip in female bars, but also in, you know, gay bars and things like that. So he's got a, a very colored, checkered past mm -hmm. here. Having somebody like that come in and, and obviously as Christians, yes, we believe in second chances. And I think this maybe is where sometimes the church can take things a little too far and lack wisdom. While we do want to give people a second chance, what does this kind of a performance, yes, it's a show of strength, to hang sideways on a bar. Yes, that kind of fits into a men's conference, but when the guy rips his shirt off and he has a past and there's a pole, you know, it's not done in the best 
place. And I'm not saying that everything you do at a men's conference has to be squeaky clean and Sunday morning church ready because it's a men's conference. There are talks, there are conversations that would be said in in an environment like that that you might not necessarily say on Sunday morning. But, But this is just a little wild and extravagant, and it just honestly just seems to miss the mark. It seems to be really dumb, just kind of a dumb thing to do. So having said all of that, you've got a pastor, Mark Driscoll, who goes up and he feels compelled to say something about all of this. And he does. Driscoll himself is no stranger to controversy. In fact, back in 2009, he had other comments from a sermon cause a stir. And he recently made a video explaining what actually happened back then. Pastor Mark here, some years ago, I had a clip that kind of went viral before there was viral. They put it on the radio. It was from a Men in Marriage series in First and Second Peter. And I think it was like 15 years ago. So I'll just be honest with you. This is just kind of off the cuff. Here was the story behind it. And for my critics and enemies that have used it, shame on you. But here's the truth. My wife, Grace, who I met at 17 on one of our first dates, there was a guy stalking her and tried to run me over with a motorcycle. We we weren't dating, we were just friends, safety. And then some years later, we were married and started ministry and had kids. And uh, Grace had given birth to our, our fifth child, a beautiful baby boy who's now a high school senior. And we were sitting upstairs in our bedroom. She was folding laundry and we were visiting. And I asked her, I said, let me just ask you some questions. So I started asking questions about that previous relationship with that person who had stalked her and I had to literally get in the way to physically protect her. Are you following what's going on, Don? There's he's basically telling a story about his, about what happened back in 2009 when he made those comments. How dare you? How dare you? He's, he's kind of telling you what was transpiring in his life leading up to that. And yeah, he's telling the story about his wife here and some things that she shared with him. And she started telling me some specific details of some things that had happened to her before I met her that I had never known. And at this point, you know, we'd been married for, I don't even know. So our son would have been, I mean, maybe close to 20 years at that time. I don't even know. And and as she started answering the question, she was busy folding the laundry. And I just started, I was weeping uncontrollably because it dawned on me that my best friend who I, you know, I care the most about, she was a sexual assault victim many times and repeatedly. And it just wrecked me. I grew up in a dangerous neighborhood. Green River Killer, Ted Bundy, prostitutes. One of the gals that was murdered was my buddy's friend and she was turning tricks. And sometimes I would be driving to work on what's called Pacific Highway. And some of the gals that were out prostituting were gals from my high school. I mean, I knew these gals and it was a horrible situation. A couple of strip clubs within walking distance in my house, massage parlors, hourly rate. And so I just saw the evil that men did to women and it just wrecked me. And I had two sisters as well. So then to hear that this kind of violence had happened to my wife, it just broke me and triggered me and we got grace some help and i started at that time researching trauma and abuse and assault and a lot of what we know today is is really new information on these issues and and this was a while ago so there wasn't as much written i read as much as i could on sexual assault and trauma and met with counselors and was trying to figure out a way to help my my best friend just kind of recover this really blew my mind like when I heard him talking about this because I, I've listened to him for years mm-hmm. on and off and uh, he did kind of go through a, a, a little bit of a falling out with his church which at the time was like the largest growing church in the country 25 years ago mm-hmm. and then he started a new church about 10 years ago and um, you know so I, on and off I mean he's been in and out of the out of the spotlight but I never understood his background and this story that he tells here not just about his wife, but about the woman that he talks to at this conference just breaks From my heart. what she had been through. And um, yeah, and so we were processing a lot of that uh, as a married couple and issues like disassociation and trauma triggers and trying to learn all of that to help Grace. And then at the time I was pastoring a church that was urban, uh, very young, and uh, it was, uh, it started off as a college ministry. And so everybody was very young. And uh, a lot of homeless kids, a lot of punk rockers, a lot of uh, drug use and abuse. And a lot of the men had deep-seated porn habits and sexual addiction, and they were not safe men. And, um, And a lot of the women were sexual assault victims and trauma victims. 
and abused. And a lot of it was uh, sometimes college campus drinking and rape culture. And so baptized a lot of young Christians. I think we baptized altogether like 10,000 in downtown chop zone of Seattle. I was out preaching in bars, fraternity parties, and I was literally going to houses where homeless kids were encamped and sharing the gospel with them and climbing through, you know, kicked down doors and broken windows. I just wanted to see people meet Jesus. And, uh, and as Grace started talking more publicly about her assault and her trauma, it just created, and it was very, very brave of her, it created a wave of women who felt that it was safe to talk about it. And so they started reporting to me as their pastor and us as their church. So, so I think what he's getting at here is like he was doing this this really rough ministry back when he started his original church back in the mid 90s. And now you fast forward to like 2009, you know, 10, 15 years later, and his wife is confessing this stuff to him that it just breaks him. And it sense, sets him on this journey and his church at the time on this journey where that, that culminates with the a clip of him, you know, yelling at his congregation there that went viral back then saying, how dare you, you know, to the men in the congregation and stuff like that. You can still but, tell that it bothers him. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can see it because he's yeah. wiping his eyes here yep. and there. This is fresh. He just released this video here, like within the week here. Trauma, their oh, wow. abuse, all that they had been through. And at this point, we were just a few years into Grace's healing and recovery process. And at that time as well, I had two daughters and uh, love my daughters with all my heart. And the thought of men doing these things to not just daughters, but the God the Father's daughters, it just made me just furious. And so the week that I was in the men in marriage, I think that sermon might have been the sixth or seventh take of the day. I would preach and then I would go up and preach again. And then I go down on the floor to answer questions and pray for people. And that was probably the sixth or seventh sermon of the day. I just, I preached myself literally almost to death on a few occasions. And I spent the whole day right with young women coming up to me and telling me how they were raped and assaulted and abused. So now he's doing this conference, you know, this is back in 2009 at his church after his wife discloses this information to him and, and all these women at this conference start telling him stuff. This particular story he's going to tell right here is literally heartbreaking. I actually, my eyes filled with tears when, when I heard him explain and this. Some of it was by boyfriends and husbands and fathers, yeah. and some were even by pastors. And by the end of the day, I was completely emotionally devastated and angry and furious at all the damage done to women, starting with my wife. So what triggered that was a girl came up to me, it was Here an African-American right girl. She had just turned 18. This was before the last service of the day. She said, Pastor Mark, can I talk to you about my dad? And I said, yeah, honey, you can do that. And uh, and I said, uh, she said, I, I never knew my dad. My dad raped my mom. And she said, so I was born out of rape. And my mom told me I was never allowed to meet my dad because uh, he wasn't a safe man. And she said, when I turned 18, I, I found out who my biological father was, and I scheduled a meeting with him. And this was a gal I knew. I was her pastor. She was in our church. I think she was a college freshman. And um, I said, oh, so you got to meet your dad? And she said, yeah, I did. I flew out, and I met my dad. And uh, I said, what happened? And she said, he raped me. I honestly started crying so hard, I threw up and then preached the sermon. Um, and so ever since then, um, uh, yeah, some of my critics and those who say I'm a misogynist and hate women, they're like, look at how angry this guy is. I'm like, why isn't every sane man filled with the Spirit this angry? And uh, if this is happening uh, to God's daughters, how come nobody's pissed? Obviously, a really somber moment there. I mean, it's almost hard for me not to like, I feel like I'm tearing up now as yeah. I'm thinking about this and picturing it, Dawn. I know you, you know, you're passionate about the whole tra human trafficking issue. Right. You know, your daughter's Trafic involved. Women. Yeah, with a with a, a, a group. Are they, are they still out of Pittsburgh or did they move? But they, it's no, called Ref still, Refuge for Women is the name of it. Yeah, the... excuse me. They, they have a home there, their house, they call it, rescue a, mission, a home in Pittsburgh. I don't know, it's Allegheny County okay. is where they're at. And they have five women that are there right now. And from what we've been praying about, and we, we get, like, news about the house, yeah. what's going on. And they never tell you 
the person's name. They'll, they'll say, like, applicant A, applicant B. They'll never tell you their names. They're not supposed to. Because everything is secret. But you, they'll say, this is happening, that's happening. This happened to this woman. Could you pray for her? You know, one woman was thinking about suicide and had told them about it. Even though she's in this, yeah. she's saved from it. And it just, it rips your heart out. I mean, I can't imagine what these women went through because guys would come into them anytime. Yeah. And they were a sex toy to that guy. Yeah. It's just unreal. And, you know, the reason I wanted to show this particular clip from Mark is because I, I, I wanted people to see like who the man really is that went up on stage. He, he isn't just some, you know, religious zealot who goes up and, you know, quite frankly, I think we need more religious zealots that are going to go up on stages, storm stages <laughs> and, and be a John the Baptist, be an Elijah to this, to this particular generation. Right. You know, I, th I think we need that. But in this case, like this is a guy who, yeah, you, you can, you can pull up these clips of him, you know, screaming, but now you get the context behind the screaming, you know, and, and you can't, you know, was he involved in a, a situation with his church uh, that he kind of had a fall from grace with 15 years ago where he created a little bit of a culture of bullying? Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he doesn't have any past or, or there's no evidence of him being uh, actually misogynistic. But mm -hmm. but to the contrary, I think you can see, you know, the heart of somebody that that wants to uh, help women. And, and sees his role as a man and a protector. Um, I, I think these are biblical roles uh, that we should have. I think that spirit is what makes us want to go up on a stage. You, you know, I, I'm somebody who puts billboards up in my community. Right. You know, marriage equals one man plus one woman. And, and we've got one out there now that says, be bold for Jesus. And, and so... So I, I understand that. I see the, the importance of going out mm -hmm. into a culture and proclaiming the gospel to people and being bold. Like now in our culture is not the time to just sit by and do nothing and be tolerance is not a biblical virtue, by the way, tolerance. What, what people, if you use the word tolerance and you're going to come at me or you're going to come at some pastor and you're, you're going to say, this is a vert, this is not a biblical virtue, tolerance. No. You see John the Baptist, you see Elijah, you see all of the prophets in the Old Testament doing the same thing. These, these people were put to death for being intolerant. Now, are we supposed to be jerks? Of course not. You know, you're not supposed to be a jerk to anyone. But this idea of tolerance, like, I think it's functionally, you know, what, what does that even look like? So, so getting back to like the events that we led with and you, you see this whole, you know, I, I don't want to just kind of throw red meat out there and say strip tease. It was not a strip tease, but it was just a strange thing to have at a men's event, you know, an, a, a semi nude guy dancing on a pole, just not, just, just not the best choice of, you know, what you're going to do. And you have a pastor who has a heart for holiness that wants, that goes up and calls them out on this. And I, in my mind's eye, when I look at this, I mean, it would be easy to kind of, you know, go down the road of, and, and make this whole discussion about human trafficking. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole thing you said there. I know it's something that you're passionate about, Don, but just kind of zeroing back in on this issue that, that, that took place last weekend. And what are we called to do as Christians in a culture that doesn't ask for our advice? Everybody has a stage, everyone. You have a stage. I have a stage. Your platform is different than my platform. So to me, what this says is like, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to build a poll, an Asherah poll? I, I, I thought his comments were were on the nose. Yeah. A poll. You know, it, it is interesting that it was symbolic, built on a high place. Okay. Christians get criticized for being over spiritual, but there is a spiritual realm. And it does exist, and these things are real. Jesus cast actual demons out of people. Right. And you think those demons aren't still around? Oh, Just look are. at our culture. Look at the confusion. Look at what's going on. Right. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, but, like, I get angry when I think about it. I got kids, all right? I don't have any daughters. I got a wife. I care about women. I care about kids. I care about my kids. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think about the stuff that is going on. Why do I put billboards in our community? Why do I make TikTok videos with my platform and not worship Satan on my platform? Why do I make TikTok videos about how about the evils of evolution, about uh, about why kids should go to church? Th this is what I do. It, 
And when I make those short videos, I'm making them for the kids in our community. Right. That's what I'm doing. So I'm saying all that to say, I have a platform, Don, you have a platform. If, if you're in the listening audience, you have a platform. Right. right. It's, it's your job. It's just, it's your community that you live in. And I'm, I'm sure you know somebody or, or people in your community. If, if all of a sudden Christianity was outlawed today and they were going around prosecuting people, would there be, this is, you know, this is what they, they've, back in the day, they'd say this all the time, you know, a little preacher trick here. Would there be enough evidence to convict you in a court of law of being a Christian? I would sure there hope be? So. You know? I hope so. Yeah. Right. But, but I think that's a good question to pose to people. Right. And, and everybody has a platform. That, that's what I, that's what strikes me about this whole situation. And am I looking at a guy like Mark Driscoll and, and standing up for him to the point where I'm saying he's a squeaky clean guy. He's perfect. He's got a perfect past. Nobody, Nobody. is perfect. No, not even pastors are perfect. And even sometimes in our zeal, we do dumb stuff. But I feel like he was on the nose with this one. Mm-hmm. I feel like he was on the nose, you know. And I, I know, Don, you've, you're hearing about this literally for the first time. I intentionally kept it from you, what we were talking about today, because I wanted to get Thank your you. reaction. Yeah. But, you know, like, uh, I mean, how does some of this strike you? What do you think about, about how, what, the, what the takeaway is for, well, for people see, with this? To see what this guy did, first off, in our culture, there's two things that run together that I know men and probably women will go to, which is a poll with taking clothes off. I mean, right away, the connotation is towards stripping. Yeah. And that put, it's, it's like, it's so much out there. And depending on your background, depending on what you've done, I mean, as far as go to these clubs or whatever in your, in your past, that's going to flash up in your mind. Yeah. So as you see him start to take off his clothes to climb up the pole, yeah. it's going to make you go back. Right. Right. What you did. And, and what, what, what if somebody in, in that, I, there was, I'm sure, in a, a crowd that large, somebody or people, probably multiple people in right. that audience, dealt struggles with homosexuality. Right, that's another thing. Right? I mean, what do you, what on earth are you doing and saying to those people? You know, I, well, it's it, it's very ungodly as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I realize he only took off his shirt. I realize it was just a poll. But it's what society has done in the past. And if you're, if you're a homosexual and right away you're attracted to another man, if he's doing this right away, it's, it's pulling you yeah. towards that, which is not good for and, you and at would all. They have, would they have had a woman go into a men's conference and do that? Absolutely not. But what transpired next was after all of this, the booing and all of this stuff, he actually gets Pastor Mark to go back up on stage and they talk. And this is this is the conversation that happened. Mark's a prophetic voice to our generation. Nothing about what was said. Mark, I want you to know you're a gift to the kingdom. You're a gift yeah, to you can see they're both up on stage together. He's reaffirming his love for Mark. He says, you're a gift to the kingdom. Listen, he says, I'll do whatever you want. I said, well, if you're willing, and we can come in and talk, and we'll let him talk to you in a moment. If you're willing, I want you to speak again. I want to find out about Elijah. Yeah! Okay, so Mark makes some comments now himself, and it's hard to make them out in the video. That's why I didn't want to play it. But this is kind of the culmination of, of things here. So you see them come together. You see this sort of show of reconciliation at the end there. He doesn't apologize for what he said. He apologizes, I guess, for the way he went about it. I don't know how I feel about that because I, I personally... I don't think he was even in the wrong for what he did in any way, personally. Ironically, again, he was giving a talk about Elijah, the spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist. And and it's my understanding that I think this was actually said at, at one point there in that reconciliation discussion. He says, you know, I looked over at my son and I said to him, son, do you want to know what John the Baptist looks like? And he pointed up at Mark Driscoll. So, so if that's true, mm-hmm. if that's true, then I think you have to heed the message that's being spoken, you, you can't just receive the words of God that you like. Exactly. If John the Baptist is giving a sermon, right, mm-hmm. and he gets an illustration on his way up to the stage, right, you need to listen to the whole sermon. I mean, I, I see this as, I, I can't think of the king that burned Jeremiah's scroll because he didn't want to hear the words, you know, in the Old Testament. But that's, that's kind of what I see this like. You know, this stuff is, I don't know, just in my mind's eye, it's demonic. I think the the, the stuff that is going on in our culture today, I think 
it's obviously infiltrating the church in so many ways. And I'm not one who looks for a demon around every corner. I'm really not. But when you have a pastor who honestly calls another pastor off the stage that he invited to come speak at his church, I'm sorry, like this bothers me. It bothers me that the pastor invited him to speak at his church and he had a message for the church, a good message, a darn good message. And, and then he calls him off the stage, doesn't allow him to give the message, you know, and then and then parades him. This is ticking me off the more I think about it. Keep talking about uh, it. He, he parades him in front of the congregation. All right. And it's a men's conference. It's not just his congregation. I get it. He parades him in front of everybody and uses him as a tool to show now we're reconciled. What's wrong with this picture? It's like leading somebody or an animal to their death, so to speak. And you're t- going down the road with them like that. And this whole thing seems so messed up. I mean, it's like, I know they had good intentions going into it, but it's like, it, it just seems like the worse you get into, or the more you get into it, the worse it got. Yeah. And I know it wasn't meant to be that way, but it was go, it seems to go that way. And like you said about, there's so much demonic activity anymore. I mean, I know there's a devil. I know it's Satan. I know there's demons. I know that. I mean, the Bible tells you that. The the demons or the devil or whatever you want to call the groups, they were like under the cover, so to speak. I mean, they were still there, but they weren't out in it. Were, here I am type of attitude, and I don't care. Yeah. That's the way they act. And the thing of it is, is how many Christians are backing down from this? Yep. How many Christians are not standing up for Jesus Christ? And see, I think Satan Satan knows that his time is limited. It says that in the Word. He knows as time grows on towards the end times that he it's limited and more limited, so he's got to do something. He's got to change things around. I mean, look at how many different demonic things that are going on, like we had for Halloween here in our town with... With them having like a strip tease, yep, yep, in that. Yeah. and the uh, the paranormal circus, right? And just doing things like this, that you know, you went back ten years ago. Maybe they'd have done that at some nightclub somewhere. Yeah, but now it's just brazen, right out in the middle of the town square. Yeah, and we we went, it. yeah, and, and we went, we went, and and actually talked to our our local trustees about this, and uh, and we're we're told that they're not being invited back. This was a big, huge traveling circus that was really like a satanic striptease mm-hmm. in the mall mall parking lot in our community here. So, so anyways, you know, I, I guess just kind of wrapping this all up, cause I got to go pick my son up from school here in a couple of minutes, but I would just want to, I want to encourage you to be bold for Jesus, mm-hmm. carry that spirit of Elijah into your culture, do it lovingly, do it gracefully, but, but carry John the Baptist with you, <laughs> that, that spirit with you. you know, and, and that was the spirit that John the Baptist had. It was the spirit of Elijah. And, and this culture needs it. They need you to do uncomfortable things because no one else is doing them. And, and, and if you're a pastor, if you're a church leader, if you're a Christian who is going to push down those who are actually just trying to make the world a better place for Jesus by casting the demons out of our community, shame on you. Amen. Shame on you. You will not experience God's blessings on on what you do on your ministry. I mean, and, and you can't even just just look at numbers or at financial prosperity and assume that that is a sign of God's touch and His hand on your life, because oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's the exact mm-hmm. opposite. So exactly. you know, seek to preach the gospel, but just be careful. Be, be careful and be thoughtful in the way you do it. And if you are an Elijah, if you are a John the Baptist, then I just want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because this world needs you. Even if people hate you, if they don't like you, they're going to call you names. You don't worry about that. You you follow God. If you're a young person in a school system and you feel like kids make fun of you because you preach Jesus and you invite people to church all the time, forget them. Think about what God's doing in your life. You serve the Lord Jesus, and I think he's going to bless you incredibly. Again, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Uh, make sure you go to PastorAJ.com, too, where you know you can get some of my cool merch, some stuff that will actually wear very well in a, a local school and educate people about things like Noah's Flood. So check that out. You can also get my most recent book that I've written called End Times Mission. It's a great, great primer on the subject of eschatology. I myself lean post-millennial, so you'll get a good education on that. May God bless you all, friends, and uh, you know, let's pray with me. 
pray with me for our country, for our communities, uh, and then just be a witness out there for for the Lord Jesus, because uh, he wants you to preach his gospel anywhere and everywhere that you can. God bless you. We'll see you next time, friends.